One of the biggest and most gruesome movements in history is the French Revolution. Heroes turned into monsters before the very eyes of the civilians. Nobles turned to bodies without heads as the revolutionaries almost literally ate the rich. But the violence was not unprovoked. As you will see in this video, almost everyone in France was starved, tortured, and humiliated for more than decades, all at the hands of people who soon would be the ones tortured and killed. Our scene is set in the Middle Ages in France. You are either one of three classes, nobility, clergy, or peasantry. In truth, clergy made up the first class, followed by nobility, and lagging behind was peasantry. So basically, it's the Pope, Jeff Bezos, or a beet farmer in modern times. The wealthy disparity was huge, to say the least. Either you were born into a king's life or a slave's. There was no concept of climbing the social and financial ladder. You either died rich or you were born poor. These two situations could never coexist. And this wasn't a sudden situation. The old regime was ancient and upheld for centuries. It would have maybe made sense if a considerable percentage was living in luxury, but guess what? Only 3% of the population wasn't below the poverty line. Three! Only 3% of people formed policies that would affect the entire country. No wonder horrors were upon them. And the system was not like ours, where the 1% makes the policies, but regardless, the other population has somewhat of an influence upon them. The ancient regime was uncompromising. If you weren't from the 3%, you politically didn't exist. And it made exceptions for no one. Eventually, the other 97% began to realize that this scheme seemed rather unfair. Why should kings only birth kings and peasants birth poor peasants? By the 18th century, a great political ideology called the Enlightenment formed. Philosophers emerged, notably Voltaire and Rousseau, who explained concepts of freedom and raised some questions that the people could not ignore. Why did they practically worship people who continually form policies that drug the rest of them further into the ground? Why do they support the classes who preferred throwing out food rather than giving it to the poor? Societies and salons saw an increase in the richer of the Parisians who gather around and debated these questions. At the same time, American colonies were economically booming as the quality of life was improving for everyone. Basically, Americans were partying until dawn, and French people were solely staying up all night because of hunger. They also saw that this change had come through war, and that it was the only way to claim their rights to life, property, and dignity. This debate continued amongst the nobles, while the poor were dying of hunger in the quite literal sense. And the injustice didn't stop in life. Let us explain. Poor criminals were executed in brutal ways, including drowning, maiming, and burning. The rich were simply decapitated, which may sound gruesome to us, but it was a fairly swift death. Yes, history is cruel. The effort to reduce injustice in death was the first part of the Enlightenment. Dr. Guillotin joined France's constituent, assembling and made a progressive effort towards introducing decapitation as a national execution method regardless of the financial status of the criminal. This is how the famous guillotine came into France. It was a prototype made in Germany and given the stamp of humanity by an assembly of surgeons. It was made the national death sentence machine in 1789. And it was a shame. You'll see that this device became the terror of the French Revolution. Even in 1789, people had started fighting for equality in life all over the country. But the tipping point came from the Palace of Versailles. That was the place where history was formed. To truly understand the nature of the revolution and what caused such an unfair economic situation, we have to go into the making of the Palace of Versailles. It was a glorious piece of architecture formed in 1682 by King Louis XIV. To be fair, he was extravagant, but not careless. His successor was the true culprit. Louis XV had a rule marred with carelessness. He spent all of his time spoiling his multiple mistresses and only came out of the castle to plunge France into debt. 
He involved the country in at least three wars against the Austrians and the Polish. These were the ones that lasted five, seven, and eight years, respectively. Unsurprisingly, France lost many of its borders, and the Seven Years' War almost bankrupted the whole country. The problem was that the Palace of Versailles was a shield. Anyone inside was so involved in the illusion of glory that they could not possibly think that their entire country was suffering. In addition to that, diseases like the plague kept the peasants busy for a long time. After the reign of King Louis XV came the teenage Louis XVI. No one, not even himself, had any idea he would rule. Then came Marie Antoinette, the queen who plunged France in the debt faster than any war could. She was vivacious and a great spender. Even though she had a wardrobe allowance of 3.6 million pounds, she blew it very easily by ordering diamonds and gold embroidery. She soon gained the title as Madame Deficit, as she continued to squander the treasury on lavish parties and dinners, according to noble French culture. Her illusions reigned far from the palace, too. Once she took a trip to the city and wrote to her mother, what was really affecting was the tenderness and the earnestness of the poor people, who, in spite of the taxes with which they are overwhelmed, were transported with joy at seeing us. This sentence shows us a truly terrifying mix of apathy and illusion. She knew that the poor suffered from the taxes, and yet, was unable to see any expression on their faces beyond wonder at the nobility. Unsurprisingly, the poor only looked upon her with hatred. They made obscene pamphlets about her and the lavish parties that drained their finances. At the same time, nobles and poor alike were beginning to wonder why the king and the queen could not give them an heir. They thought it made Louis a powerless king. As their image deteriorated, Louis and Marie pledged an incredible sum of money to the American Revolutionary War. This absolutely baffled the poor. He could have fed more than seven million of his own people with that sum promised, and yet he chose to spend it for a completely separate country who had better living conditions than France. This was one of the most sharply felt betrayals that the classes could not ignore. They would see to it that he was punished. This was the second last mistake. One more to go, and he was gone. This was the backstory of the French Revolution. It is tainted with pain, tragedy, and poor choices made by generations of rulers. What mistake do you think was King Louis' last? Here comes King Louis' greatest and final mistake, stealing food from the poorest of his people. He made a policy which deregulated grain and that basically removed any restrictions regarding grain. Now, we don't know what exactly he expected would happen, but the turn of events was quite tragic. Price of bread increased almost ten times, which was the people's main source of food, by the way. Imagine if ramen increased their price to $50. Yeah, we'd slaughter the people responsible too, huh? So now, most of the people in France couldn't afford what they had been living on. Just barely, but surviving all the same. Bakeries became more looted than banks, and people stole and lynched just for bread. Where did all the grains go? To Versailles, of course. They had parties and nobles and princesses to be fed. And here, the most famous quote of the French Revolution was born. Of course, the king and queen were informed that their people were basically dying of hunger. The ignorance was willful. When told that the people could not afford bread, Marie Antoinette turned up her nose and said, Let them eat cake. Gasp. Now the people were even more angry. The court dwellers advised Louis to elect a finance minister finally. This is how the Enlightenment penetrated the old regime. The newly appointed finance minister was an enlightened thinker. He went out to seek equal representation of the peasants in the estate generals. The estate generals were a voting party made of one part nobility, one part clergy, and the other part commoners. It hadn't met in centuries, but even before, the first two parts voted the same way. They approved any vote intending to make the peasants suffer. 
like everyone expected them to. Now, the new finance minister wanted to make sure that at least people had some kind of representation as a party of ambassadors, even if it was a weak one. Turns out, it wouldn't be weak. Enter Robespierre, one of the most prominent figures in the revolution. Robespierre was a lawyer and one of the less poetic members of the Enlightenment. He believed in action. Remember him, because he will come back into the story as a terrifying force later on. People began clamoring to be the one to represent the people. They put out flyers and posters advocating the efforts of the Enlightenment. They all said something along these lines. Nothing can function without the rich now, but everything would be better if they died off the face of the earth. Everything would be free and flourishing. And for a moment, everyone did believe them. Not the rich people, of course. They still loved themselves. A representative party was born nonetheless, and Robespierre was one of the representatives of the people in the estate generals and debated for two months about the rights of the people and how every class should pay taxes, one of the many points we agree with. Finally, some members of nobility and clergy started to see sense. As the first two classes were losing power, they resorted to petty obstructions. They bolted the doors of the meeting place. The third party members were unbothered and simply held the meeting in a tennis court without them. A very cool move. Here they formed the tennis court oath. They would take power in their own hands by becoming the National Assembly and writing a constitution only for the common people of France. Still, during the early days of the National Assembly, there was peace. For a little while, it looked like the nobility might actually listen to the National Assembly. But when 30,000 troops around Paris were stationed, it became clear that the nobility and clergy did not want to solve disputes politically. People stormed armory after armory and prepared for the war everyone knew would break out. Calm before the storm set in, and people waited for that one signal to declare war. This came unintentionally from the nobility as they removed the Enlightenment finance minister from his post. There was no announcement. There was no mobilization of troops. On July the 14th, people simply picked up their weapons and headed for Bastille while creating sheer chaos. Okay, hold up. Why Bastille? Why not Versailles? Bastille was actually a prison that nobody knew much about, except that common prisoners were tortured there. It had become a sign of injustice on the common people by the clergy and nobility. Truth is, the French Revolution got out of hand that very day. The crowds killed the guards and stormed inside. Two symbols of the French Revolution were born, the tricolor flag and the heads of previous arrogant and immovable guards. They freed everyone as expected and left no surviving authority in Bastille. But they also stayed behind and blew up the place. The fall of Bastille was very much literal. In Versailles, Louis' jaw dropped on the floor, but the National Assembly said, It's all good. It's fine. Bloodshed was necessary. Here, the Declaration of Rights of Men was formed when they declared all men equal and authorized freedom of press. Robespierre was one of the vehement protesters of the limitations on freedom of speech, so he was glowing from the development. The nobles actually thought it would spread the news of the Declaration and quell people's thirst for justice. It was almost funny how wrong they were. Freedom of press just gave way to excitable and extreme folk taking their violent thoughts to the crowd. Many consider freedom of press to be the death warrant of the nobility and clergy. One of such many violent journalists, Marat, told people that Louis had torn up the flag of the revolution and people went crazy. They took up arms once again and this time waited for no signal at all. They simply started looting and creating havoc wherever they heard nobles were staying. Still, the violence was not in Versailles. Yet, there was just one event that catapulted the entire country into frenzy and marked the first defeat of King Louis. It even made him evacuate the palace of Versailles. 
What do you think the event was? Previously, the start of the revolution had not reached King Louis, and that was to be remedied fast. Hordes of women stormed the palace of Versailles and demanded bread from Marie Antoinette. Then they insisted that both the king and queen went along with them to Paris. Insisted as in put their guards' heads on multiple spikes and said if you don't want this to happen to you, uh, you better come. Louis signed the Declaration of Rights of Men and then went to be exiled in Tuileries Palace. Paris became the center of the revolution. Even the National Assembly set up their headquarters in the city. Now defeated, the nobility pretty much signed whatever the people wanted them to sign, and Marie Antoinette was appalled. Then she made another bad decision to add to her very long list of terrible decisions. She convinced her husband to go to Austria, where her family was the ruling class. While they were trying to escape, guards saw them, and they were brought back on heavy watch. Unsurprisingly, when you try to leave your people under quote-unquote dirty revolutionaries, uh, said people get very angry. They said Louis skirted away like a rat, and his number of supporters dwindled further. The National Assembly was also not doing so hot on the decisions front. Thinking that Austria might be sympathizing with Louis, they declared war on Austria and Prussia. Marie Antoinette continued to write to Prussia, and the king said he would burn down Paris to the ground if anybody harmed the king. The people did not like that statement. They stormed Tuileries and captured the king. He was put on trial like any other ordinary peasant, and was found guilty instantly. After he was found guilty, the National Assembly had no idea what to do with him. This effectively split the assembly in the two parts, which made the revolution even more messed up. One side was called Girardins and the other Jacobins. The leader of the latter was Robespierre. But on the streets of Paris, rebels were expressing themselves through fashion, wearing long trousers instead of knee cutoffs that were worn during the old regime. People were so sick of the old regime that they declared France a republic and even created a new 10-day calendar that aimed at making people forget Sunday, the church day. Now, none of the parties in the National Assembly liked Louis at all. The Girardins only wanted to spare his life, while the Jacobins thought that he must die for the rebirth of France. The decision came in 1793. Louis XVI was to be guillotined for his transgressions against France. Unsurprisingly, Louis's death didn't calm down the people. The wars against Austria and Prussia became ways of spreading the revolution and the fighting further split the National Assembly. The terror of the French Revolution started this way. Eventually, the National Assembly sent revolutionaries to fight the war, and the people left behind were rallied up by the opportunistic journalist Marat. His demand was simple. Kill all the political prisoners. He said that with the number of anti-revolutionaries more than the actual revolutionaries in Paris, they were bound to break out and escape. The long trouser crowds stood up and slaughtered almost all the political prisoners in France without sparing women or children. This bloodbath was known as the September Massacre, and this was what brought the French Revolution its international reputation. All of Europe began to wonder whether this was an enlightenment or just plain murder. Even Paris had to reconsider its stance in the French Revolution. With anarchy on all sides, Robespierre rose up to rule Paris. The people considered him to be just a ruler, but soon he too would go super crazy. The most haunting aspect of the French Revolution was how no one was safe. The guillotine was steadily working at all times, and it only took one person saying that you sympathize with the aristocrats to have your neck put under the blade. No one was spared. To the people of France, executions were as dull as church mornings, but the provenance was appalled. Quickly, the anti-revolutionaries rose up in many areas, but the Republic put them down faster through mass executions. They were all tied up and made to face the firing squad. The bodies were then dumped in open water. One supposedly smart anti-revolutionary arrived in France and got a meeting with Marat. 
where she stabbed him in an effort to reduce the intensity of the revolution. She was put on trial and then guillotined. She might have been a little bit less stabby if she knew the extremely dire consequences of Marat's death. Meanwhile, the people hadn't forgotten Marie Antoinette. They put her on trial for way too many crimes, and the only one that she protested against was the abuse of her son. She begged and pleaded for all mothers to see sense, but the sympathizers could not outweigh the haters. She was found guilty of all charges against her. On her indictment, she famously said, I was queen and you took away my crown. A wife and you killed my husband. A mother and you deprived me of my children. My blood alone remains. Take it, but do not make me suffer long. After her statement, Marie was ripped away from the arms of her daughter and sent to a prison cell. The conditions of the prison cell were appalling. Judges thought that the most infected place in the prison, with a few straws for a bed, was more than she would have spared them. The queen and her wardens were put under constant surveillance. There was still one attempt at escape, but the guard that was bribed was held up and the former queen was transported back to her prison cell. The prosecution still had no sympathy. They even said to the person asking for a cotton blanket for the queen, You dare ask? You'll be sent to the guillotine. The queen's final moments are haunting, but also a little fake. She made a huge show about how she lived for her children and her sister when the people of France had only seen her blow through their funds. So her lamenting and dignified suffering came across as a little fake to the people. The queen was executed by the guillotine. But by now, the guillotine had become a living creature, constantly hungering for flesh and blood. The one ruling party left in France broke down into two pieces. By 1793, this divisiveness became very clear to the general public. The more harsher group, called the Jacobins, arrested the more lenient group, called the Gerardins. This meant that the whole National Assembly now consisted of really crazy radicals. This meant that the Great Terror was launched, a scheme that aimed to get rid of counter-revolutionaries. Robespierre, who we had previously mentioned as a pretty sensible guy, uh, turned quite harsh as well. He even reversed free press, even though he liked hot-blooded journalists sharing their views with the world. The problem was that said journalist might share views opposing Robespierre. So by now, he had complete control of France. During his rule, two very important organizations were made. The second one was morally disgusting, to say the least. The first one was called the Revolutionary Tribune. Their job was to investigate anyone who uttered a single word against the revolution. Actually, not even against the revolution itself. Anyone who said a word against any one of the revolutionary principles whether it be the guillotine working way too much or the banning of free press, was charged with treason. We may think this was an extreme measure, but nobles that had escaped the country were planning to kill those dirty revolutionaries and make France great again. The second of these organizations was called Committee of Public Safety, a pretty ironic name as you will find out. Uh, Robespierre personally oversaw the committee. What did the committee do exactly? They watched public executions. Not even conducting them, they just watched with sick satisfaction as the guy who said maybe not kill everyone executed as his family watches. Of course, Robespierre didn't think it was wrong. He said reign of terror is nothing other than justice, prompt, severe, inflexible. This inflexible justice would come to bite him later. Robespierre's power grew as the history and culture of France was erased, which made the other National Assembly leader, called Daton, very uneasy. He actually understood the part where the revolution would come to bite its own leaders, but he was the first one to face the music. Danton spoke against the running of guillotine 24-7 and was promptly handed over to the extremely just Revolutionary Tribunal. They claimed his concerns were treason, and all of his partners were to be guillotined alongside him. Before dying, Danton predicted the same fate for Robespierre. His prediction soon came true. Actually, before dying, 
he said his only remorse was that the rat, Robespierre, had not died before him. Regardless, by this time, all of Robespierre's potential opposers were dead. But for every man he killed, he gained five enemies. When he saw that people might oppose his mindless genocide, he started the Great Fear, a movement where he hunted down counter-revolutionaries and became responsible for at least 800 executions per month. He also started a new religion with himself appearing as the new God-staunch Christians were supposed to worship. He made the introduction by ordering a papier-mâché model of a mountain with himself in a toga on top. People would have laughed, but the guillotine was making way too much noise in the background. After this event, people went from viewing him as a strict ruler to a mad one, and they could deal with executions. But France had already dealt with way too many crazy rulers in the past. Robespierre immediately detected this shift in the atmosphere and wrote yet another document that would send more people to the guillotine. However, before he could deliver the document himself and his allies were carried off to the tribunal and a trial was set up. Robespierre could not bear to be executed in the same place he had sent so many people to. So he shot himself. Unfortunately for him, he was really bad at aiming, so he blew off his jaw and yet survived. His opposers found him withering in agony, but they had experienced his gleeful smile as he watched people he murdered. They had no sympathy for the monster. Robespierre was executed by the guillotine that very next day. And it solved almost none of the problems.